Ooh, and we are back, ladies and gentlemen. Hello and welcome to the 96th episode of the Black Ink Podcast. I'm your host, Jake Kerr. I'd like to thank you for joining me today. And of course, put your seatbelt on, buckle in, because we're going to get fucking crazy on whatever the fuck spews out of the top of my head. But let me start with the most important thing that's happened to me of late. This trophy. I got awarded this trophy on Friday night by a very close friend of mine at one of my beer pong tournaments held at Brooklyn 32. Now, give you a bit of an up-close look if you're watching on YouTube. This is your standard Golden Gloves uh, boxing trophy. Well, I'm guessing Golden Gloves. It has the Olympic torch uh, on the front here, which, of course, makes it a little bit more confusing. But, hey, I'm going with the flow. I'm the trophy recipient, not the one who's giving it out, so the aesthetic shouldn't really bother me. It's obviously got the boxing glove on top there. And on the plaque, it says, Jake, black ink, keep being you all the way to the top. Now, I got given this by a friend, Dakota Crispin, who's actually the owner of Anytime Fitness in Australind. Hell of a guy. And I guess to really like encapsulate what actually happened is like, I didn't know this was going to happen. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about my beer pong events at Brooklyn 32, because this is the second one that I'm holding out of three. The next one is this Friday night. But more to the point is someone paying attention. Okay. And... I know I talk about it all the time on the podcast. Forgive me if you're sick of hearing this topic, but I genuinely am trying my hardest. And in that, I look for other people trying their hardest. And when I see other people trying their hardest, I try and reward them for doing so. And in the business world, that's typically just giving them the business that you know you can give them. If I need something done, I know I can get it done locally or I can get it done over here. I try and seek out the local person. And if they have a really good business, if they've got a really good person steering the ship, the ship itself is awesome, then why wouldn't I give them my business? But this is just a step beyond. This is like Dakota watching me from afar and then deciding like, I want to do something that no one else is going to do for him, that no one else has done for him before. And I want to fucking pr- present him with something that's kind of iconic of how I feel about his work. And whether or not I've hit the mark on that Dakota, I'm sorry, that's how I accepted it. I can't believe that someone gave me a fucking trophy for being me. Like I don't, I did 10 years of skating and didn't get a fucking trophy, right? I, I literally was racing at the top of, uh, you know, at the, what do you call it? Like at the highest echelon, I couldn't have gone any higher if I tried. I was racing with the guys who are world champions and never got a trophy. I didn't get a trophy from my local club, from the Australian club, from any teams that I were on, that I was on. I didn't get a trophy from winning. And that's not to say I didn't win. They just didn't give out trophies. The point that I'm making is I spent 10 years in a fucking sport and didn't get a trophy. And I've been in business less than two years. And another business owner gives me a trophy for my efforts. Now, do I deserve it? Absolutely, I deserve it. Okay, everyone knows, everyone who's listening to the podcast, paying attention, or even just getting a a fucking, what do you call it, a a milliliter, the tiniest speck, a quarter of an ounce of the work that I'm putting into my marketing and my business knows that I fucking, of course, deserve a trophy. Now, the sensible part of me says, what the fuck? My event got stopped halfway through, or not halfway through, kind of after the tournament part was done, and Dakota grabbed the microphone and... That start of the speech where he goes like, oh, there's one person here and like, you know, if you're that person that he's going to fucking call you out. And the worst part is, is like, it's in front of all these people that I don't necessarily know. They're people that wanted to be a part of the event uh, so that, you know, they could play for the grand prize of what I'm giving away for this beer pong tournament. So it was a little bit awkward for me, but I think even if it had been in front of my friends and peers, it still would have been awkward because as much as I know that I'm doing good work in my own opinion, understand when I say this, this isn't me being egotistical. This is me knowing exactly the output that I've given and recognizing that so that I can use that knowledge, that evidence and that data to keep achieving things in the future, right? Let's touch on that for a second. I can't in my mind knowingly push forward and try and progress If I believe I'm a piece of shit, I can't believe in my work if I don't look at my previous work and don't go, fuck yeah. If I look at my previous work and go, ah, that's not so good. The only thing that I've got to move forward on is let's do better than last time, right? I've changed the way that I see things. Everything that I do, I want to get it done. That's the main thing. I don't want it to be timely, but I want to do it to the best of my ability. When I'm done with that job, I want to make sure that I can look back and go, oh my God, Black Ink did that. I did that. My team did that. The people that I'm working for got me to do that for them because of my skills, right? 
And it used to be that beta shit before where I go like, you know, I do what I can do with the skills that I've got and I put it out even if I don't necessarily like it, I'm just trying to do better next time. I'm not saying that's not a good way to think. I'm saying that that way of thinking is now in my past. The way that I strive forward now is how do I make this the absolute best possible case scenario, reverse engineer whatever that experience is and make it happen, right? I need to know moving forward that not only my future work is absolutely unreal, I need to know the work that I've already done is unreal as well. I need to know that I have a reputation for a reason, for the evidence, for the data, right? So when I say something that seems egotistical, and this applies to you as well, I want you to be confident in who you are, and I want other people to think that you're egotistical, because they might think you're a bit of a cock behind your back, but if you've got the evidence to show it, they know you're a cock for a reason. They know you can fucking do it. That's why you're the cock, right? So fuck yeah, I believe in my work, and fuck yeah, I, I deserve a trophy. But to have someone materialize that, and for someone to fucking make a speech for you and say, hey, this person knows, everyone knows, but now we're going to have a moment to actually address this particular piece of information and give this person something that's symbolic of their success or part of their progress or part of their journey. And for me, that actualized on Friday night with Dakota Crispin giving me this trophy. So Dakota, thank you. And for everyone who believes that he did the right thing in giving me this trophy and congratulating me on my success so far, I thank you as well. Because I know this trophy didn't just come from him. This came from that little band of believers who fucking can see what black ink is in their mind the same way that I can see it. So thank you, Dakota. Thank you, everyone. This trophy is going to be on display in my studio forevermore. So if you ever drop by, make sure you fucking get a photo with the champ. Right? There's the cover photo right there, by the way. That's the cover photo. Get a photo with the champ. Get a photo with the fucking, with the trophy. Man, shit's got to go. It's fucking, I want to keep it in the frame, but it's also fucking huge, you know? Oh, look at that. Fills up the frame just nicely. So... Let's talk about these beer pong events. Now, if you didn't know, Brooklyn32 approached me about three months ago and said, look, Jake, you're so good at what you do. Can you please do it for us? Okay. And look, it's not verbatim, but it's close enough word for word. You understand? So they got me on board and they said, look, we need you to market our product the same way that you market yourself, but in a similar style, not necessarily exactly what you do for Black Ink. I said, look, I know what I'm doing. Okay. Daddy's a professional. All you do is give me the keys and you look the other way. Give me the keys look the other way. And that's what they did. Okay. So I start doing their marketing. I start, start arranging photo shoots. I'm working with other businesses. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I hold the Brooklyn bust up. Absolutely amazing, successful event. The bust up round two had coronavirus. Couldn't even be there myself. What was it? Uh, successful as fuck. So I come up with my next event, which, which is of course a four round, round robin tournament of beer pong held at where else but Brooklyn 32. Now, I go in there and say, guys, I want to hold four Fridays back to back. I want to have beer pong tournaments. I want to have a massive prize at the end. Get together all of our business friends, put together a massive prize pack worth whatever we can build and have some fucking fun. Okay. Now I want this to be, and this is the thing, like you have to understand from my marketing point of view, I'm not building a beer pong tournament for the people who are playing. I am building a beer pong tournament for the people who are playing, the audience they'll bring and the drinks that they're gonna drink before, during and after that event. Now, I fully advise you not to drink before the event because we're not promoting binge drinking or any sort of um, you know, drinking that can get you too intoxicated or even intoxicated at all, actually. We're just promoting a fun game where you don't even have to drink the cup if it's out, it just means the cup is out if a ball lands in it. Now, this whole exercise is to get as many people through the door as possible and also get as many people once they leave the door when they go home to chat about Brooklyn 32, okay? So this is for even the people who are in the bar who aren't participating, who don't quite know what is going on. They just came to Brooklyn for a drink on a Friday night, okay? And they see and they hear and they experience this beer pong thing going on in the background. Now, maybe they're a little bit too insecure or maybe they're not really interested in beer pong, whatever it might be, to not come and involve themselves and that's fine. I understand that life is scary. People don't like interrupting other people, especially don't when they don't know what it's for, okay? But on Wednesday afternoon, they're sitting in the lunchroom with some other cunts they don't like at a job that they're only doing to pay off a house that they're probably gonna lose half of to their fucking partner. And what do they start talking about? Oh, I was at Brooklyn on Friday night. They had a fucking beer pong game there or something. Yeah, it was all sectioned off and there was like an official and they were like taking breaks and going back to it and there were winners and losers and then people could play the winners and blah, blah, blah. 
yeah, it's fucking, I don't know how to, I don't know what it's all about, but yeah, hey, that was a conversation about Brooklyn 32 that wasn't happening before that whole experience, right? So what I do with these events is I try and create the event and then I try and add value onto it. I add value, I add value, I add value, add value around the back here, I add value, add some value and then put value on the front. So basically it doesn't matter what you came to the bar for, you'll find something that will please you, okay? Now, this is what I do with Black Ink. This is what I did with my OnlyFans bullshit that I did before with Tucker. This is what I do with what I did with Here Fishy. This is what I did when I was a fucking truck driver working for a boss. I tried to add as much value to the person at the end of the day as I possibly could. Now, one thing that I did do as well is created a game called Play the Bar. Now, this is something that we picked up from a bar in Perth, I believe is called... What's it called? it's a hidden little bar varnish on king is the name of the bar and they had this game where they had a little a little cup picture a little cup in your head normal size cup reduce it down to about a quarter of the size about that you can see it in your head thank you put that cup up on top of a shelf behind the bar and the and the fucking sorry milk mouth the goal was to throw a two dollar coin and if you got the two dollar coin into the cup you get a free drink. And if you don't get it in the cup, then the $2 coin just ends up back there somewhere, right? So that means that, and look, guys from Varnish or anyone who's been to Varnish, if I'm cooking the story, who fucking cares, okay? I don't care if that's actually how it happens. It is the structure of what's going on that I borrowed and employed in the bar, okay? So stick with me. Now, if you get the $2 coin in, you get a fucking free drink. If you don't get the $2 coin in, you don't get your $2 back. So I thought, what's a way that we can make this fun, accessible, understandable for the patrons at our bar, not only the ones playing beer pong, but the ones who are just there having a good time. And I thought, well, we can set up three cups behind the bar because it's actually a reasonable space between the bar where you order and the bar where all the drinks are all stacked. So I moved some drinks aside in the middle and I put three cups in there and we fill it up full of a little bit of light alcohol. And then I give ping pong balls to everyone behind the bar and I say, look, if you can get the ping pong balls in the cup, depending on which cup you get, depends on what prize you get. Now it might be a discount drink. It might be something on the house. It might be, it's, it's up to the bartender's discretion. I am the marketer. I'm the ideas man. I'm the one who comes up with these things. Now, was it wildly successful? Hey, of course it was wildly successful. You know why? Because people like having fun, bro. Okay. So round one, which was last week. Now, the beer pong side of it, bit of a shit show, right? You know why? Because I've never done anything like this before and I'm coming up with new ideas and trying my absolute best. Now, what do we get? What are the results, okay? I got eight teams playing each other, which means we got four winners, okay? I also had a little bit of a reason to go out after the fact. So here's how the whole night went down, okay? My whole day was just a shit show trying to organize like tables and getting something around the table so it can be sectioned off and no one can fuck with you and getting the whiteboard set up and getting the cups, getting the balls, getting the DJ set up, getting the lighting just right. And of course, leaving everything to the absolute 11th hour to do so. But regardless, we got it done. We got four games played. We got four winners to move on to the next round and we got to play, play the bar. Now, let's look at exactly what happened with play the bar because the big beer pong side of things I can tell you this much. We did have two tables set up inside of the one sectioned off area with two officials. The problem was we had too much going on at any one time. So as an audience member, you couldn't be watching the games as they happened. So I immediately figured out like, right, we need to cut this down to just one table and we need to have just one official and heaps of spare space so that everybody who's not playing has just one thing to focus on. Now, did that work in round two? Fucking perfectly, okay? so. The other thing we have to mention is this play the bar pong. Now, as I mentioned, it's got the three cups behind the bar. And the hardest part about this is, is getting people to understand what the purpose is and what the intention is, okay? So the intention is to get people involved with the bar, to get them up out of their seat and closer to the bar, because what are they gonna do while they're at the bar? Hey, nadoi, buy drinks, okay? Marketing, what's up? So. I get them all up to the bar. I give everyone and like, instead of just having the one or two balls that are in play on the game of beer pong, I had like a hundred balls and I just gave them out to everyone, giving two to some people, giving three to some people who you know they're gonna bring their other friends up and go, oh, here's a ball. And then everyone's up at the bar and they're throwing the balls in. Now I ran three rounds of this. A round lasts about five to 10 minutes because people in general are actually fucking hopeless at getting ping pong balls in cups. Now, 
out of these three rounds, you keep going until someone gets a ball in a cup, or if you get a little bit of a run, if it happens too early, you wait until all the three cups are done. Now, for the bar staff behind the bar, it's absolute mayhem. It's absolute mayhem, okay? You know why? Because there are multiple ping pong balls flying across the bar at any one stage while you're trying to take orders, make drinks, and take payments, okay? But it's for five minutes at a time, and the reason that you're taking orders, making drinks, and taking payments is because I've just brought all of the fucking patrons up to the bar and got them invested in a game that is situated around where you purchase drinks. Now, the majority of those people who are in that bar are there because of the event that I set up, which is beer pong, which makes it contextual, right? All good, all good. So, Last week, we collected all this data as to how to run the best game of beer pong, how to officiate at the best, how to advance the winners, how to get rid of the losers, how to deal with people that are too drunk that want to play but didn't sign up. We also learned how to deal with play the bar. We learned the best way to do it. We learned how to time it all out, right? So round two was on Friday night. Super difficult not to go really hard on Friday night, by the way, because we were having drinks Saturday night at our house. So, of course, you don't want to send yourself on Friday and then be too hungover to do anything Saturday. So, I was just like, focus on getting an early night, focus on making it happen. I moved the whole event back an hour. So, it did start at six on the first round. I started at seven on the second round. And I did this because people only start getting a little bit how you're going at 6.30 at the earliest. So, you want people who are already in a vibe playing the game. You don't want to be creating the vibe with the game because then when you close, they disappear. You want people to already be hanging around, having some fun, doing some shit, then play a game of beer pong and then continue their night, right? Now, this worked an absolute charm and I figured out, well, I actually guessed before I started that what I would need to do is put those play the bar games strategically somewhere about half an hour after we start, about an hour after we start and then right before I finish and then I'll pack up all the bar, clean everything up, good to go. So I did exactly that. On this round, round two, which was still just new players versus new players, all the players who won round one and all the players who run round two, they're all different people. Now they all play each other in round three where we'll be having the semis and the finals. Now I know what you're thinking, Jake, you said you would have four rounds. Why would you put the finals on round three? Just shut the fuck up and let me get the other half an hour of this episode out of the way and you'll find out. Okay, so next week we're going to have round three. We're going to have all the winners playing the winners. Okay, so if you are a winner or if you're a, if you're a potential audience member, know that this round coming up on Friday the sixteenth, I believe it is, eleven twelve. Ah, oh, dude, off the top of my fucking head, I was right. How about that? Hey, hey, you know what's up. Anyway, so basically, I ran the first game ran the second game, and then we decided to have a bit of a break, which was perfect because now we're at 7.30, 7.35, 7.40-ish, and I was like, right, people have started to have some drinks. It's dark outside. I've got everything set up for play the bar. Let's go do that. So we start doing that. Bah, 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 bah. Dude, someone gets it in under three minutes. What do you do? You give the man a half-price drink. You set everything back up. You collect all the ping-pong balls back up. Go have a cigarette and get ready for game three and four because we had a break after game three. So the officials can have a cigarette. Everyone can kind of have a chat and a mingle. People can ask me questions if they need to because obviously I'm the person who's running the running the show, gig, festival, tournament, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, so I go and run the first round of play the bar. It's successful. It's all good. We go back. And we start the third game. Now, the third game did go a little bit longer than I was anticipating. And by this time, you've got some of the... So all the people who were watching it as audience members, now some of them are drifting in and out of the smokers area, going to the bar, dragging their feet a little because the initial excitement of watching beer pong has started to settle down. And that's fine. And I get that. That's what happens. So I go, right, we need a little bit more pong hype in here because while I'm here, I want to... I want to optimize my time. I want to optimize my value while I'm here so that we can, so that by, when I leave, it's not like, oh, Jake just fucking showed up, did his bit and fucked off. It's like, no, no, Jake showed up, did 150% of the work he's meant to do. And then after everything was clean, he fucked off, right? So anyway, I go up to start set up the, the second round of play the bar. And I notice that there's a, a fill-in bartender. Now, Forgive me, I forget her name. I know that she was there last week. I maybe have seen her the week before as well. Obviously, I'm in and out of the bar all the time as the marketing and events director or whatever you want to call it. And I like I, I knew this chick. I was like, oh, yeah, cool. Hey, what's going on? Anyway, without going too far into exactly who this other person is, this other person that I recognized from school and partying with years ago 
comes up to me and she's like, oh, hey, how you going? Like, right, right, gave her a hug. And uh, I didn't realize, but she was, she'd been called in because apparently she's worked at Brooklyn before. And by the way, I'm fucking sorry if I'm throwing anyone's name under the bus here. I'm just explaining what my role is with this business and what happened coming up next. So, hmm. So anyway, I fucking, I organize myself and I start walking around the bar giving out ping pong balls. Now, the idea of this is that people who know what's going on see you giving out the ping pong balls and they head towards the bar. Oh my God, it's like I'm a marketing genius cunt. Why? Well, we've already educated them with what that means, right? And by giving them the ball, we create an automatic behavior of the customer walking up to the bar ready to throw the ball in the cup. And what happens when you walk up to the bar? Well, it's the same as when you walk up to a a urinal. By habit, you pull your dick out of your pants and you get ready to start pissing. When you walk up to the bar, even if you don't get your card out of your wallet, you put your hand over your jeans pocket just to make sure it's still there. Ah. Anyway, hey, fuck me and fuck what I know, you know, right? Who cares? Who cares that I got all these potential customers up to the bar? The point is I got them there to play beer pong, right? So I start walking around. I'm giving out ping pong balls. I'm like getting that hype, you know, and then you get obviously the the group of girls that just walked into the bar and you're like, hey guys, you're going to play the bar, take a ping pong ball, chuck it in one of those red cups behind the bar. If you get it, half price drinks, other prizes, whatever it is, get the ball in the cup and we'll look after you. So they're getting all excited and you give them a couple of balls each and you can just feel the whole vibe starting to pick up. So super exciting time, right? So I get behind the bar and as I walk behind the bar, and by this point, I've put all of the different drinks in, sorry, all the emu export in the cup. So they're right to go. And people start throwing their balls. And I hear the manager say to this chick that will go unnamed, okay? So, oh, just so you know, there's balls going to be flying around everywhere. It gets pretty crazy in here. And I've gone to start picking up balls that have already been thrown. We're literally like five seconds in, 10 seconds in. I'm picking up these balls, chasing them. And as I turn around, this uh, casual employee or fucking, I don't even know what we're going to call her. He's going to give it, I'm not calling her a bad name. I'm just letting you know what happened. So she yells at me at the top of her voice to get the fuck out of the bar that this isn't a playground, that you can't be bringing your shit in here, that you can't be fucking doing this and fuck this and fuck that and absolutely letting it go. She's been on shift for about 10 minutes at this point. So I've been setting this event up. I mean, the planning of it takes hours, days, you know, having sit down, sitting down in meetings and organizing things and figuring out the structure and doing the risk assessment and I mean, knowing what fucking policy you have to review under the regs for drinking, gambling and liquor or whatever it is, like just so much planning has gone into this, you know, to even figure out if we can legally do it. And that's all good. Right. And I've got all of last week's experience. Right. Don't forget the going up to Perth to do the bar hop to figure out what everyone else is doing as part of research and develop development, like do understanding what the what the competition has to offer. If you include that as well, well, we're up to a good fucking at least 24 hours of research, development, and planning has gone into this, right? Right? All good. Now, I had been there for a couple hours earlier that day setting everything up, which includes the cups behind the bar, which includes the ping pong balls to fucking throw into the cups, the whole lot, right? And then that night, I've already been there for two and a half, three hours, running beer pong games, talking to piss people, trying to negotiate and navigate everyone so that they're in the right place at the right time, having fun, getting value, right? Right? And we get 10 seconds into this round two and 10 minutes into her shift and she treats me like I'm a fucking idiot who just wandered behind the bar and started doing shit that I wanted to do. Hey, and that's all good. That's my fault, okay? That's my fault because of all the planning that I did and of all the fucking minute by minute by minute guide that I had laid out for the whole thing, it didn't involve telling new bar staff what's going on. Because the reality is those first those first 10 seconds of that playing the bar game would have been fucking mayhem for her to realize like, oh my God, what the fuck is, why are there so many people, what are you doing behind the bar? You don't fucking belong here, right? And of course, I get the tidal wave of profanity and assumptions and telling me where I can go and I leave the bar. I leave smiling, right? I leave with that smile on my face that if it wasn't anything else, it would be absolutely fucking disgusting. I leave with that smile as I look at patrons who are watching what's going on 
shrugging my shoulders because they know they've already played around and play the bar. They may have even been there the week before, okay, where they've played several rounds. So they know exactly what's going on. In their mind, they're probably wondering, hey, who the fuck is, who the fuck is this person who seems to be the only one in the whole bar who doesn't know what's going on? Okay. It was my fault. Somewhere in my planning, I skipped telling all of the bar staff what's going on before it happened. Now, if I'm honest with you, I didn't know that she was working there. I knew that she was standing at the end of the bar and I knew that she was, she said hello to me, but at no point of me going behind the bar and doing shit and getting things that I need, did I ever see her say, hey, by the way, I'm going to work behind the bar. So I guess she didn't, look, I'm not trying to make excuses, okay? All I know is I got yelled at like I'm a fuckhead by someone who was only there because my event was so successful that it deemed her being called as backup. That's all I know. That's all I know. But this draws to a bigger thing that's happening in my life right now. I'm leveling up as a businessman. I'm leveling up so much that in my last podcast, in episode 96, the real 96, the one that's actually uploaded on YouTube but hasn't been posted because I got too fucking real with it. I talked about some shit that's been going on in my life lately, in my business life and in my personal life, where there's no denying it. I'm just at a different stage now. I think differently. I move differently. I make different decisions. And man, that podcast got so real, I started crying and shit on it. I started talking about my sobriety, my addiction, the real shit that I have to tell people that's probably just a little bit too real for episode number 96 with the future that I'm fucking destined to have. Because what happened on Friday night That wasn't something bad happening to me. That was an opportunity for me. That was a test to see how I would respond. And me six months ago, me a year ago, me five years ago, had three different situations eventuate from what happened. But the way I dealt with it on Friday night, walking out of the bar smiling, knowing that there was going to be no resolution in that moment, knowing that realistically there's going to be no resolution to this situation at all, I walked out of there with a smile. I walked out of there unscathed. And while emotionally I came home and I had to deal with someone ruining my night in 10 seconds when overall I got given a fucking trophy. I ran a successful beer pong tournament. I had people patting me on the back and shaking my hands, telling me that I'm doing well. And again, I'm not being egotistical. I'm being confident. I'm telling you. I had that taken away from me for someone yelling at me for 10 seconds. An opportunity to learn? Sure. An opportunity to apply another layer of Teflon to me? Absolutely. An opportunity to retaliate and call someone the same things that they called me to really let them know with actual knowledge and data rather than just fucking calling names and assuming they know what's going on? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm in it to win it. Not all of it, but my bit. And my bit involves doing shit with integrity. My bit involves doing things the right way. And the right way of dealing with that is letting everyone else tell her that she's wrong. I don't have to. You know why? Because I fucking move differently. I move differently. And dude, it's taken me so long to be able to say that and confidently know it. That's from having shit in my past that's done so fucking well that it's undeniable. That's from knowing that the shit that I'm going to do in the future because of the things I did in the past is going to work. I'm sorry, I'm just putting wind in my own sails today. It's Monday morning. I woke up feeling fucking fresh, all right? We had a big blowout over the weekend. And then when we did our fucking, when you look back of over everything that happened in the night, it's like, I actually didn't blow out that hard. I just had a really good time around some really good people who all, all chose to be around me on a Saturday night at my house without going into town. How lucky am I? I feel rich. I got a fucking trophy on the weekend, dude. That's what's happening. Now... I did actually want to touch a little bit more on what's going on in my life and why I move differently and why shit's different. But every time I think about it, I can't, for the sake of the, for the sake of um, not disclosing anything that I shouldn't, as far as other businesses are concerned, I can't really speak about it too much right now. But there will be a time in the future where I can talk about it. I guess if anything, this is just a note to my future self that this is around the time it all happened. I haven't posted properly for about six weeks on YouTube. I did post that podcast I did with Gage which we're going to talk about in a second, um, which obviously kind of got me a little bit of a bump, did really well for my YouTube page, did really well for my Instagram page, actually. 
But the reality is I haven't really posted much at all. All through having COVID, uh, the recovery from COVID, just getting through the winter range, getting through the bust ups, I think I really let myself be everyone else's skill set except for my own. And it kind of sucks in a way because now that I've taken a bit of control back with Black Ink and I've taken a little bit of control back with my energy and my time and my value, now it's like, fuck, I wish, I wish, I mean, part of taking that time and energy and control back is recording more podcasts, is creating more content, is putting more out there in the name of Black Ink purely because that's what I'm fucking doing. That's what all of this is about. You know, like it's a t-shirt business, it's a clothing business, it's a podcast, it's this, it's that. At the end of the day, it's fucking 99% marketing and you don't give a fuck about my t-shirt. Oh, sorry. If you don't know who I am, right? So I need to spend all my time making sure you know who I am, whether it's through pod pod clips, full podcasts, skits, reels, photos, stories, whatever it is, I've got to make so much more of them so that people know who I am. And dude, right now it's the 11th of July, 2022. By the 1st of January, 2023, I want every motherfucker in Bunbury knowing who Black Ink is. And if you don't know who it is, you've at least heard of it and you're wondering what it is. Because at the moment, there's 100,000 people in this town and greater surroundings, probably more. And I know for sure about two and a half thousand of them know me. So I'm 97 and a half thousand people of having this town fucking dominated. That's what's up. I'm not fucking around because if you were me, why would you want anything less than everyone in Bunbury knowing who you are? And I've had to learn that my population, that my audience isn't in Melbourne. It's not in Sydney. It's not in America. It's not in Finland. It's not in New Zealand. It's right here in Bunbury. It's right fucking here. And I'm happy to take over the world, but why the fuck would I take over the world if I haven't even got my own town on lock? If people don't even know me when I walk down the street? I'm not saying that's what I want. I'm saying that's a byproduct of what I'm trying to achieve. And I think that's fair. I think that's fair. So my goal that I set for me, that by the end of this year, fucking everyone has heard of me. Everyone has heard of me. I don't know how to do it yet, but I'll do it. Shit. Now, let's talk about the podcast with Gage. Amazing. Over 500 views on that video, and it goes up every day, right? I've finally bumped the over 100 subscriber list on YouTube. I'm finally there. I released 95 solo podcasts by myself talking shit, which gets me 88 subscribers. I post one video with Gage that goes for over an hour. It has 500 views, which is over 1,000% of anything that I've posted yet. And it bumps my subscriber list to over 100. Hey. I might have something to say, but apparently people want to hear what I've got to say in conjunction with what other people have got to say. So guess what's come more of? Two-person podcasts. And look, I know I said I would wait until 100 episodes before I did my first two-person podcast. But to be honest with you, who gives a fuck about these ideas? Oh, sorry. And these rules that I make in my head, I'm more committed to just getting the content done and out, done and out. And look, I'll admit, the Audio with Gages podcast is fucking pathetic. If you haven't heard it, go and listen to it right now. Open the video, skip to 22 minutes in and listen to it. It's terrible. And you know why? Because I did what I could do with the shit that I had on the spot and I fucking posted it. I had two microphones. Gage isn't familiar with speaking clearly uh, into, you know, as close to the microphone as you possibly can. He was kind of sitting back on the couch back here and speaking quite softly and just doing, you know, just doing this sort of conversation, which meant that we didn't have that clear audio. But if you're a diehard fan, which apparently Gage has 500 of them, you listen to the whole podcast anyway. So if you did listen to the podcast and you enjoyed the terrible audio, I thank you. And I'm telling you now, I'm putting all of my energy into figuring out how I can find the money to buy myself a wireless transmitter for my microphones, which would allow me to put the microphone right next to our mouths or even just behind, you know, kind of alongside us or even figure out some sort of boom where I can have the mic hanging in front of us, whatever it looks like. It means that I'll be able to get super great quality audio. And on top of that, on top of that, I know you love watching my podcast, the videos here on YouTube, because of the excellent quality that I give you from my front-facing camera on my iPhone 10. Now, even though you love this quality so much, I had to do it to you. I got to get better quality, okay? And yes, I'm being sarcastic. I know it's terrible quality. Just hear me out. So, what I've done is I got myself a Canon M50, a mirrorless, basically a mirrorless SLR, DSLR. 
that allows you to pretty much create Instagram worthy content from the get. So I was borrowing Maddie Blake's uh, camera, which is an Olympus or something, uh, which is a mirrorless as well, to take photos for the bar and for black ink. And basically this thing, you just point it at anything and it takes amazing photos. So I did my research, I figured out what the Canon equivalent of that was, and I've gone and put one of those on layby. Now, what I'm now working towards is putting all of these things together. I want to record all of my content for Instagram, for, for all socials basically. I want to record my podcast, both solo and conversations with other people. And I want to record all of my review videos and all of those sorts of things on this one camera set up with the wireless transmitters for the mics that I've already got. I've got a mic here and obviously the mic that's plugged into the iPhone right now. I've also got flashes, I've also got beam lights, I've got tripods, I've got everything that I need. So basically what I'm looking to do right now is to increase the overall quality of all of my content to give it more of a professional feel. And I also need one more set of hands. Okay, so Black Ink is currently in a stage now where I would greatly benefit from having someone holding the camera rather than me holding the camera and speaking into it. Now, obviously my podcast is the one thing that I don't actually hold the camera myself, but everything else is held from an arm's length away and it's zooming in, zooming out and me talking to the camera and me doing, me doing. There is a limit, there is a ceiling, there's a boundary of how far you can go when you're the person holding the camera and the person recording. And even if you set up a tripod, there's only so much you can do with a camera on a tripod by yourself. Basically, I'm at the stage now where for at least one day a week, I could have someone following me around creating every single bit of content that we need and being able to use that content for the following week. And when they're not collecting that content, they're editing the content of last week. Now, I'll have the camera, I have the microphone, I have the lighting, I have the studio, I have the computer. I have everything that I possibly need for a videographer to work for me. I've even just about got enough spare money that I can pay them a little bit for that day. I just don't have that person yet. And strangely enough, I feel like that person is going to be pretty difficult to find because I don't need a videographer. What I actually need is someone who wants to be a videographer in the future and can find that passion through recording videos for me. Now, I know you're thinking, Jake, that's a very specific sort of person in a very interesting scenario that you're talking about. But that's exactly what I need. That's what my ultimate fucking goal is to find someone who's like 18 years old, stoked just to be a part of the story and gets to use all of this equipment and gets to be around all of these things happening as they happen for the sake of it happening and make a little bit of scratch on top. And you know what? If in a year's time they want to fuck off and do their own thing or they want to buy their own camera or they want to up their rate or want to do whatever they want because of everything they've done with me, then fucking so be it. Here's more money. Here's the better equipment and shit. If we're producing content that's actually fucking doing something, then of course, I'm going to provide you with better and better and better equipment. Now, this isn't an advertisement. I'm not asking you as the person who's listening to this or watching this, but if that is within your vernacular, if that is perhaps something that sounds attractive or interesting to you, and you have a spare day every week that maybe changes from day to day, and you're interested in, in partaking or fulfilling that position, hey, reach out, okay? Because I need that person. I'm going to give you most of the basics that you need. And I totally understand for the first month, you're basically going to be fucking hopeless. But I'm hoping with enough experience and with enough pointers and with enough seeing what you've done and what works and what doesn't work, that like a normal progressing human, you turn into the person that I need for this job, right? And again, I'm not attacking anyone. This isn't ego coming at it. I'm telling you exactly what I need and exactly what I expect. How fun would that be? But besides from that, we've got the new equipment, We've got the fucking, obviously we've got, uh, yeah, so like the camera, I'm working on getting those wireless mics. I've got the, um, fuck, what else is, oh, no, 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 I, I absolutely need some new AirPods. One of my AirPods hasn't worked for a good like six weeks and the other AirPod is now like, I use it in this ear or I'll use it in this ear upside down if I'm going, oh, I got earrings. That's what I was meant to say. I got fucking earrings the other day. So I got my ear pierced. You can, you can just see maybe. I'm not going to get closer to the camera, but I got this ear pierced because I've always had the left ear pierced as a fucking 17, 18 year old, like every dickhead in this town, I wanted to stretch my ear. So I stretched my ear to like 10, 12 mil, whatever it was, and then took it out because it went out of fashion and I didn't want to be one of those people with the fucking, you know, vagina flap earring sort of thing. So I ended up forever. I've wanted to get this other ear pierced. And I think that's originally because my dad got his other ear pierced probably about five years ago now. And I was like, oh fuck, I want to get my other ear pierced like dad naturally. 
and uh, never got it done purely out of fear of how much it would hurt. And I know what you're saying. Oh, you're covered in tattoos, rah, rah, rah. Like, yeah, shit hurts and I don't like it, okay? Just because I have heaps of things that hurt doesn't mean that I like pain. It means that I can tolerate pain. And if I have the choice to not get an earring today because it's maybe going to hurt, I'm not going to get it. So I did the bullshit thing where you book it so far ahead that it doesn't matter. You just get to the day and you go fucking do it. And of course, it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt. Now I just look cool as fuck with two black little diamond earrings. Hey, hey, I'm sorry. That's just a game I'm playing. All right? It's all good, but your boy's got earrings now. Your boy's got earrings and a fucking trophy. And I don't even play in a sport, right? I don't even play in a sport. It's dangerous. Shit's different now. I told you shit's different. So, outside of the camera and the and the wireless microphone situation, I tell you what I do have a lot of. I don't have a lot of. I've just got a considerable amount of my winter release yet to sell. Now, obviously, I haven't released the check shirts. I haven't released the socks. I haven't released the jerseys. So, that's all going to be part of the second installment of the winter release. Now, I'm going to photo shoot all of these things. I have the check shirts. Sorry. I have the check shirts. I have the socks. No, I have the jerseys. The socks should be here like today or tomorrow. So I'm hoping to get my models, hopefully one day after work this week, get my photographer. If I have my camera, I'm just going to do it myself. Just bang out a whole bunch of photos of all these things. And then I'm going to have a physical release probably around Friday, Saturday. And then I'm going to have an online release the following day, just as we've done with this previous round one of the winter range, right? Now, the one thing that I won't be doing is having it at night around alcohol. I feel like what I'm going to do instead is have it in the morning around coffee. Now, what this means exactly, I don't know, but follow my stories, follow my page, follow my Facebook. You'll know everything as it's happening, as it happens, okay? Sorry, I fucking didn't plan that sentence out of my head. But on that as note, on that note as well, please do me a favor. If you haven't already subscribed to my YouTube channel, sorry to be that guy, please do it. Give me a like give me a comment, give me a subscribe, because at this point, I'm still just cracked that 100 subscriber list. I wouldn't mind it if I kept on going because that's what your boy is trying to fucking do, right? Let's not forget though, after the winter range, it was funny, all the girls got talking at the winter range at Brooklyn 32 where I held the uh, VIP winter release, right? And all the girls are talking to each other, which turns into a group chat conversation, which Riz is a part of. So Riz tells me the next day, she goes, you know what all the girls want you to do? I said, what's that? They all want you to do G-strings. I said, really? 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 Because that's interesting, right? That's interesting because up until now, Black Ink has been a men's brand, right? And Black Ink has been a men's brand in that I have made clothes that I want to wear, right? May come as a surprise to you, but I'm a man. I'm a boy. I'm a male. I'm a male, right? So what I do is I create clothes that I like wearing and then other people who identify as the same gender and sex as me wear those clothes as well, okay? I know, shit's so complicated, it's hard to follow. And then what you do is you get chicks who are organically into black ink because they think I'm cute or they like the brand or they watch the podcast or whatever it is. Hey, hey, I don't blame you. Look at me, born like this, can't help it, all right? They end up wearing black ink and the boyfriend still their jumper or they still their boyfriend's jumper or however it works. But realistically, 99% of the customers who were buying and wearing the gear were boys. Now, what I did for the winter range was something a little bit different. I made it a men's range and then I made 30% of it a women's range, which means that there was all the hoodies, all the crew necks, all of the half zips, even the track pants were available in a women's cut as well. So a little bit shorter, a little bit wider, whatever it might be. Shorter for the jumpers, wider for the pants, by the way. So for the torso and for the hips, not being sexist, all good. So what I found was that chicks do this funny thing where they buy the pants and then they buy the jumper because it matches, okay? And then they buy the hoodie as well because it all also matches the pants. And then they buy the half zip because it also matches the pants as well. They're interested in having the whole collection, the matching set, the this and the that. And the guy comes along and he buys the hoodie and he wears that hoodie every fucking day for the next three years and tells everybody about Black Ink and tells him tells him how much he loves Black Ink and that he the whole experience, all the rest. But what girls will do is they'll buy the whole set. They'll do a TikTok video in the set. They'll wear it a couple of times and then that becomes house clothes. And then they're looking for the new set. 
and the set after that and the set after that. And the set thing isn't necessarily important. It's the fact that you get things that go with things, whether it's a tracksuit, top and bottom, earrings to shorts, socks and t-shirt, whatever it might be, it's a set and it's on recycle. It's on repeat, right? So I learned something about this, that girls have more of a repeat wardrobe where they want to create new looks, new styles, new vibes, and they want to repeat that all the time. I keep hitting the microphone. I'm so sorry. So I was like, okay. So we've learned from the VIP launch that girls buy, on on average, their, their spend is more than what a male will spend. A male will, will buy one or two things or a female will buy, you know, I know one chick told me the other night that she spent $360 at the winter release, right? Insane, okay? So we know that females like to spend more. We know that females have a better relationship with their clothing as in they're more dialed into what looks good, what colors work, what they will wear, what they won't wear and how they represent themselves based on what sort of brands that they're wearing, okay? And now we know that girls will give me direction as to what they want next. You ask a guy and they're like, oh, I want a fucking tea. And then you you make what you think is a really cool tea, you know, something like this. And then you sell 15 of them to your two and a half thousand followers, you know? And then you say to a chick like, what should you do next? Um, you could probably do like a sports racer top. You could do like some uh, bike shorts that I could wear to the gym. I would love another pair of socks. G-strings are cool. Have you ever done a boob tube? Like chicks know what they want. Chicks know what they want in general. They can give you a basic structure of what's going on. But a guy just says the most obvious answer. And then when you deliver what they ask for, it still won't be the right thing. And obviously, this is a gross, generalized thing. And for the fucking obscurity that it, that it's... Uh, I don't even worry about it. I was going to fucking say something funny, but it wasn't funny. So it's all good. Anyway, so I put up a story on Instagram the next day saying, Hey, I just need to settle a bet. Does anybody want black ink G-strings? Yes, no. Hey. More people responded to that story than has ever responded to any story fucking ever that I put on Instagram. Like I'm talking like it was like 90 something responses to it saying, fuck yeah, I want G-strings. And you know what the crazy part is? Out of the fucking woodwork, the the majority of them, the overall majority of them were fucking female as well. Because obviously you're going to have guys saying like, yeah, I want a G-string. Ha ha ha, it's funny, you know. But actual girls saying that they want G-strings. Hey. Who the fuck is this dormant female audience that's been laying in the fucking way out back for the past however many months? This is crazy. Firstly, they show up to the VIP release, they spend their money, and now they're telling me what product they want next? Hey, if Black Ink didn't just change direction slightly, uh, I don't know what the fuck just happened. I feel Black Ink developing into more of a female brand. Not a complete female brand, of course, but I really, hey, I like creating stuff. I like designing stuff. I like creating things that haven't already happened. And to be very transparent about the future of Black Ink, I'm trying to steer away from things that everyone else can do and steer into shit that not only I like doing, but is actually pretty hard to execute because I know that that's what will separate a brand. Because you right now, can go and buy a blank t-shirt from Kmart and you can take it to a DTG printer and get some bullshit logo that you pulled off the internet that you hope no one's going to realize and ask that printer to put it on there and then go and sell that shirt. And you are no better or worse than black ink. I mean, yeah, I get better quality shirts to print on and I design my own shit and I've already got the relationship with the DTG printer and I can take that shirt from them and I can sell it for probably more than what you can sell yours for. But the fact is we can still do the same thing. Okay. And it's not that hard. Can you make G-strings? Oh, it's all over. It's all different now. You know why? Because you can't fucking make G-strings. You can't do that. Do you know why I can do that? Because I've been talking to suppliers, manufacturers, and producers all over the world now for over 18 months. Because I've got a list of people that I can ask which direction I can take. Because I know the questions to ask. Because I've been busy doing it, right? I got a fucking trophy on Friday night. That's why you can't make G-strings and I can. And again, hey, not ego, confidence. The reason I'm telling you this is because I will be releasing G-strings shortly. And the releasing of G-strings, kind of like the beer pong event, which who the fuck else is doing that in town, right? Kind of like the Brooklyn bust up. Who the fuck else is running events in this town? No one. And that's why everyone in this town will know about Black Ink. And that's why when I do take over the fucking world, that 
I don't have an M for that sentence. Actually, you know what I do? Uh, I do have an M for that sentence. What I'm going to do, be good to your mum, because I'm fucking out. Yeah!